eight top tips for cloning your Muse receptor. If you've been watching the series of videos I've been doing on cloning the Muse receptor, you will know I've had one hell of a journey uh, to actually get it to work. Now I have got it to work, so if, you, if you've not seen part three and part four, um, I'll let the cat out of the bag. Yes, I have managed to clone the hard drive, but not with an SSD at the moment. Okay, so I've managed to do it with a standard drive or a standard mechanical drive. But I have got it onto a SATA drive and I've also got it onto a much bigger drive. Um, but this process, I've taken some very important learnings from. And I thought it was probably reasonable at this point to summarize those learnings into these eight top tips. So here we go. Remember, like, comment, subscribe to the channel. Go over to Instagram and follow me there. Go over to Facebook, follow me there. That's where the normal notices are. And consider becoming a Patreon. If you can, use the Muse machine to do the cloning. I've attempted to clone the disc in the receptor several times, well, more than several times, if I'm honest, um, using both setups that use the Muse machine as the processor that's doing the cloning and using another machine that's using the processor that's doing the cloning, uh, e.g. a more powerful Windows machine, I, aka my laptop. Um, and I found that I could only get the process to run correctly using Mu the Muse machine as the processor. Um, so what do I mean by that? You know, I mean that the Muse machine is actually doing the cloning of the hard drive itself. Um, now I'm not saying you can't get it to run in other ways, but I have not been able to make it work properly. I've always had an issue using any other machine but the Muse machine. So my successful runs of cloning the hard drive have been using the Muse machine as the processor. Plug the target drive into the SATA port of the Muse motherboard. And I should point out at this point that if you're a Linux and aficionado, you probably can get around some of these limitations. But I'm not a Linux aficionado, and a lot of people out there won't be. So this is the easy, the easy option. I've tried the process of plugging the SATA drive into, a, into an external caddy, um, and plugging that into the USB port of the Muse. And while it is recognized as an external hard drive, and I've appeared to have made the cloning process work, it hasn't. I've not been able to boot from the image that's been created using the caddy. Um, I tried all kinds of different approaches to that, but the bottom line is I couldn't get it to work properly. Um, however, putting the drive into the SATA port on the motherboard and cloning it that way, I've now managed to successfully do that three stroke four times on the trot. So from my perspective, using the SATA port on the mother drive is the better option. It's also quicker. I should point out, I should point out it is also quicker. Now, I will have to point out as well that my Muse is a Rev C OS 1.7, uh, and I've seen different comments from different people about the fact that below 1.6, SATA is just not supported. Uh, and then I've seen contradictory comments to that. But I stand by what I say plug the SATA drive into the port on the motherboard if it exists. The SATA port on the motherboard must be set to IDE. Um, by default, on my RevC, when I got my RevC, the SATA configuration was set to RAID. Um, and I've since learned that the board addresses the SATA drive plugged into these SATA connections differently. Um, a drive plugged into the SATA port that has been set to IDE is addressed in one way, 
and a drive that is plugged into the SATA port that's set as RAID is addressed another way. And you will notice this when you start the boot up process. If you start the boot up process with the SATA board addressed as an IDE drive, then you will see it sequenced out as SDA, SDB, SDC, if you look at how it sort of loads it up. And if you see, if you have it set to RAID, it addresses as an HDA, HDB. So the machine itself is addressing it differently. And the OS of the Muse is not looking for that other location. And that's all I can put it down to. Now I've had a conversation with a couple of people about this and they've said, oh, you just need to change X, Y, Z. Now, again, if you're not a Linux aficionado, which I am not, fiddling around with boot scripts and um, various other Linux scripts to make it do things in different ways is not something a beginner would feel easy doing. And unless you've got step-by-step -step instructions about how to do something, it's not the easiest thing to do. So if you set it to IDE, funny enough, it works. The Muse RevC is supplied with two gigabytes of RAM. Be aware of that. What do I mean by be aware of two gigabytes of RAM? Well, if you go through the user groups, there are a number of people who say use certain programs to do the cloning exercise. The problem with that and the journey I've had is that a number of these other programs, A, some of them are free, B, some of them are chargeable, some of them are very cheap, some of them are very expensive. But a number of these other products I found very quickly need more than two gigs of RAM. Now, the motherboard inside the Muse, here is a Muse, um, is basically set as a 64-bit motherboard and it can address more than two gigs of RAM. However, the operating system is a 32-bit operating system and therefore can only address a maximum of about three and a half gigs of RAM. And these, or my machine that I've been doing the exercise on, should I say, has two one gig uh, DIMM chips in it, giving it two gigs of RAM. A number of these other programs require more than two gigs of RAM. Um, for argument's sake, Partied Magic, which was one of the other programs that was suggested to me, needs more than two gigs of RAM to run, and therefore will bomb out every time you try to use it in default mode. Parted magic cannot be used. A number of people, when I started this journey, said, use parted magic. Parted magic will do the job for you. It's better than Clonezilla. Although it contains Clonezilla, it wraps the whole thing up into a much more usable environment for Linux management and disk management and system management. Um, however, this nice GUI doesn't work. <laughs> um, so I'll give you the reason why I struggled with Parted Magic. Um, Parted Management will display a Linux desktop on the target machine that you're loading it up onto. Um, and I was able to get the Linux desktop up on other machines and be able to examine the drives that I was trying to clone or the drive I was trying to clone. The problem is Parted Magic, A, to run in uh, native mode, which is loaded into RAM, needs three and a bit gigs of RAM. The machine itself only has two, so that fails. And then when you run it in the other mode, which is called light, what it's meant to do is run from the stick. Now, running from a USB stick is not a problem. However, it goes through all the checks to the point that it's loading the desktop up. And as soon as it loads the desktop up, the VDU craps out and you can't see what's actually going on. And again, I suspect if I was a Linux aficionado, I could probably go into one of the um, one of the load scripts, and I could make some changes there that would allow me to load it onto the 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 receptor. But I'm not. So the bottom line is, it will not work on my receptor, and therefore I am turning around and saying, you cannot use Parted Magic to do this process. <laughs>
the Muse Receptor Rev C at version 1.7 will not recognize an SSD. I qualify that. I initially bought 250 gig SATA 3 Samsung SSD for this project. And nothing I have done will allow the motherboard in my Muse Receptor to recognize the drive. It's plugged in correctly. I can plug other SSD devices in because I've successfully cloned my IDE to an SSD, sorry, sorry to a SATA instance. So I know the SATA port is working, but it will not load a hard, uh, uh, um, an SSD, a SATA 3 SSD. If I put the SATA 3 SSD into a remote caddy and plug it in via USB, it can see it. So it's not the SSD that is the problem, it is the motherboard that is the problem. To make sure I wasn't completely going balmy, I borrowed two other SSDs from friends of mine that they weren't using. One was a Crucial SSD and one was a SanDisk SSD. Both were relatively old, I mean four or five years old, and both were SATA 3 standard as far as I could tell. Neither of these would work either. I'm drawing a conclusion here that maybe it's the SATA 3 specification that is causing the problems. I've not been able to find an SSD that is SATA 1 spec. Um, I've tried, I can't find one, I will continue to look for one. But at this point in time, anybody who says they have an SSD running on the Muse receptor is not running it, as far as I can tell, using the SATA interface. They may be doing something like a PATA to SATA um, transformation in the box itself, but they are not running the thing natively. I can't see how you do it. So my recommendation is don't try it. Don't waste your money buying one. This is a numpty one. Format your hard drive before you do anything with it. Um, unless you're buying a brand new hard drive, you have no idea what the idiot before you, or I said lunatic before you, has done with that hard drive. You could be getting it in any sort of state. Um, at a minimum, do a full format of the hard drive, not a quick format, so quite often when you plug things like this into a Windows machine through a caddy, it will say, do you want to do a quick format? You don't want to do a quick format because what a quick format doesn't do is a quick format just deletes the files. Actually, to be fair, it doesn't even delete the files. What it does is it delete the references to the files in the, um, in the machine, but the files themselves are still on the disk. A full format will go through the disk and check the, the disk for bad sectors and disk problems and therefore you can then form an opinion of whether you want to use that disk going forward. If you've got lots of bad sectors, then it's probably worthwhile just binning the disk and not using it going forward. Um, but that's what a full format does. If you've got tools like Parted Magic for argument's sake, or RTT tools, which are the two tool sets that I have, um, then you have access to tools that allow you to do a much deeper format. Um, I tend to run a very low level military format on a hard drive when I get it. What that does is effectively it writes ones and zeros to all the um, areas of the disk, therefore erasing what was on the disk completely. Um, what that does is it gives you confidence that A, there is nothing on the disk that can affect anything you're trying, trying to do, and B, you understand the health of that disk before you try to run these processes. Believe me, an unhealthy disk will cause you more problems trying to work out why it's not working when re in reality it is working, but the disk is not healthy enough to support what you're trying to do. Use a PCI keyboard. What do I mean by PCI keyboard? Well, I'm going back to the old, old keyboards, which had a round termination, a very small round termination. If I turn this machine round, like so, and put it to camera, up here you can see a green and a purple port. These are the old PCI connectors. The reason you need a PCI connector 
is because when you're dealing with the BIOS and you're dealing with the low level Unix command line, depending on where you've interrupted the load process, then it depends on what drivers have been loaded onto the receptor. The machine itself will not, again, going back to this is a RevC version 1.7 produced around 2008. The BIOS itself won't recognize a keyboard that is plugged in on the USB ports. The reason for that, the USB ports are not enabled when the BIOS is thrown up to screen. You therefore need a PCI keyboard to be able to navigate your way through the BIOS. Again, when we come back to loading the Linux kernel onto the machine, if you interrupt that and go to a command line, depending on where it's been interrupted, depends on whether it's loaded the USB drivers that allow you to use a USB keyboard. It similarly follows that you can't use a wireless keyboard because that uses a USB dongle that's plugged into the USB uh, ports. And again, if the USB drivers have not been loaded and support for the wireless keyboard has not been loaded, you can't use it. Moving forward, once the thing is fully up and running and you have the Muse screens uh, or the Muse GUI on screen, yes, if you've got a wireless keyboard plugged in, you can use it. If you've got a USB pl keyboard plugged in, you can use it. But in those initial stages, while you're trying to do stuff in the BIOS and the Linux command line environment, use a PCI keyboard. That may mean you need to go and get one. Alternatively, if you go onto YouTube, um, so not onto YouTube, onto eBay or Amazon, you can buy a USB to PCI e adapter, and you may need to go and get one of those to make your keyboard work with this in those low level environments. Hopefully, those eight top tips will save you a lot of headache when you try to clone your Muse receptor, especially the earlier ones. Um, all that remains for me to say is live long and prosper and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.